Hello, I'm Gillian Murphy. I'm the Curator for Equality, Rights and Citizenship at LSE Library. And this video, we're going to be looking at some archives from the Women's Library that, are, that relate to colonial history. And I'm very delighted that we have Natalia from the University of Portsmouth, who is going to talk through some of these archives for us. So what we're going to be looking at today is the entanglements uh, between sort of colonialism and women's, art, women's lives and the traces that you can find of those um, in the archives at the Women's Library. So there's a huge literature on the role particularly of European women uh, in the colonial project. Um, so we, you know, it's been well established for, for many, many years um, that um, a certain group of women in particular, sort of upper class women, middle class women, were particularly invested uh, in, in the colonial project, uh, um, in, in advancing uh, colonial rule, not necessarily um, uh, just because they thought colonial rule was a good thing, but it could also become part of sort of feminist projects in the late 19th century and the early 20th century as well. So this is the term, the term that's sort of commonly used really to describe these women is sort of imperial feminism. Feminism. So this is the idea that women such as um, Josephine Butler um, would use the condition of colonised women um, as a way of basically arguing for political rights for them sort of back in the metropole. Um, so basically saying, you know, men are, are terrible colonialists, um, you know, look at what they're doing in terms of sort of prostitution law, their, their failure to address things like child mar marriage and so on and so forth. And actually if women have the right to vote, then the colonial project would be um, more humane and therefore to a certain extent more sustainable as well. So obviously there's sort of a lot more nuances uh, to that as well. Um, but the, the idea of the ways in which sort of feminism and imperialism are entangled is something which is, is very well known. And then of course we have women such as Sylvie Pankhurst who, you know, it's well known that she is a suffragist, a uh, suffragette, um, and she's also an anti-imperialist and particularly she's very engaged uh, in uh, opposition to the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, of Ethiopia, um, in the 1930s, and um, her struggle for women's rights and anti-colonialism are very much sort of intertwined in her activism. So, of course, what I haven't even begun to speak about at all is actually the place of colonised women um, in these stories. So, their voices, um, their perspectives what agency they, they might or, or might not have had um, within the structure of, of colonialism and uh, the societies in which they lived um, as well. So one of the big questions that we're asking when we're looking at all of these archives is about the intersections um, of class and race uh, when we're examining uh, women's history. So obviously the stories that we're going to be mainly finding in the archives are the stories of upper and sometimes middle class women um, who are European women but there are ways um, to find the stories of working class women and also find the stories of colonised women um, through those documents so we're going to be thinking a little bit about that. I'm actually a historian of Algeria um, and I mostly work on very contemporary history, um, actually oral history. Um, so you might wonder, what am I doing in the archives of the Women's Library? And it began because I was interested in bringing along um, some of my undergraduate students to, to get into the archive, have a look at some of the documents. Because one of the things that I think it's really important to think about, or something you can gain a lot from, is the materiality of the archive. There's something about touching a document or an object that helps you understand it much better than if you know you see it digitized or, or transcribed which you know both those things are fantastic in terms of you know widening access to people who can't physically come but there is something quite special about sort of the materiality um, of the archive so Edith Maud Hull we can see a picture of her here uh, in her wedding dress um, is a very, very successful um, novelist of sort of romantic novels um, in the interwar period. Um, they are all on a more or less similar theme. Um, they're basically romantic novels uh, about European women sort of going off to the desert, um, meeting um, Arab men and falling in love and the, there's quite a lot of sort of swooning. There is also, as you might uh, well imagine, uh, quite a lot of sort of orientalist stereotypes and I think some of the images 
um, that we can see here um, are really quite telling. Um, so this is the Desert Gila, um, in which we can literally see a white woman swooning um, on an Arab man's horse. Um, the captive of the Sahara, so again, sort of playing on a very familiar sort of Orientalist trope um, about um, sort of uh, women or European women sort of being, you know, captured and held by sort of very macho, masculine sort of Arab men. Um, but her most famous novel, uh, the one that was really a huge success, is this one here. Uh, which was called um, The Shake, and we can see sort of a picture of the Shake here um, riding in um, on his horse. Now, these weren't novels uh, that Edith Mortal Mortal was just, you know, making up in her head and sort of, you know, writing in her bedroom. She does come from quite a privileged background, um, and we can see this when we look at her birth certificate. So, looking at Edith Maudhold's birth certificate, we can see here that, that her dad is a ship owner. So she comes from you know, a wealthy family, and this is what actually sort of allows her to, to travel a lot, and she does indeed travel um, in the Sahara Desert, and actually later on in her life she travels um, in the Sahara Desert uh, with her daughter, who, who's called Cecil. Um, and there's an account um, in the archives um, of their trip. And the account uh, of their trip is actually very interesting because it's quite scientific. It's talking about plants and birds and things like that. Whereas, you know, the novels, they are these romantic novels um, playing on these sort of orientalist tropes of the exotic. Um, it's also, you know, they're very sort of sensual and sort of very sexualized and representing colonized people in very stereotypical ways. Um, they, are, they do actually make her an extremely rich woman. And, and also in the archives, um, one of the things that I found really interesting is that we have um, all of the um, contracts um, that she uh, basically signs. Um, so it's the publishing rights for the book, but also the film, uh, when she signs over the film rights for the book. Um, and one of the films in particular, the film Adaptation of the Shake, is really, really incredibly popular. Um, it stars one of the heartthrobs of the silent era, Rudolf Valentino, um, and it is a huge success. You can still see it, see it on YouTube uh, today. It came out in 1921. Um, and he, he was an absolute megastar. Um, he died very young in his early 30s of either appendicitis or a gastric ulcer. And uh, 100,000 people reportedly sort of turned up for his funeral in Manhattan. Um, and a riot broke out because uh, not enough people sort of could get to see his body. So this, this really was sort of a, a cultural sensation. It shows the ways in which even for people who would never travel to the colonies, how the colonies were brought to them um, in sort of very stereotypical ways um, that to a certain extent are really, you know, the product of the fantasy and the imagination of, of Europeans. So these are the archives of the British Women's Emigration Association. Um, and there were a number of emigration associations in the late 19th, early 20th century encouraging uh, women uh, from Britain to migrate to the colonies, primarily what would be termed sort of the white colonies, um, so South Africa, uh, Canada, um, although there are some documents in there as well about migration to Kenya. Now there were different uh, reasons why this was promoted. So initially, when, when we think about when colonial rule first begins, it's primarily uh, led by uh, colonial officials who are men, um, and you know the military who who are also men. And increasingly, and this is not just the case for the British Empire, but across empires, there, there comes to be a growing fear in the 19th century, and of course this is in the context as well of, of um, emerging racist ideas about race and the pseudoscience surrounding that. There comes to be concern that these men are having sexual relationships and therefore children uh, with local women, and therefore the migration um, of white women is to be encouraged. So when officers start to have their wives out there, or colonial administrators start to have their wives out there, they then need staff um, to look after their children, to clean the houses, and so on and so forth. 
And some of that is provided by local colonised women, but again, and this is connected to, to the idea, ideas about, you know, moral, um, about sort of racial hygiene and things like that, there is also a preference to have sort of white women from a metropole go out to do that. Now, in these particular cases, these are actually quite middle class young women that they're sending out. Um, and they tend to be uh, women from what would be considered sort of upstanding families who might have fallen a little bit on sort of financially hard times. Um, and the idea is that, you know, they would be performing a service in the colony um, and at the same time they will, you know, no longer be a burden on British society, um, difficult to marry off uh, and potentially um, in, engaging in sexual activity outside of marriage and things like that. So it's seen as a solution to what are perceived to be multiple social problems. So in the archives we can find the minutes of some of their meetings and you can see um, the real sort of attention is really documenting everything. They're, sort of, they're very, very detailed, um, both sort of in terms of you know, keeping the financial accounts, keeping a record of, of what was decided. And I think that that really gives the sense that, that although these are associations in which you know, the vast majority of women are um, running them, are doing so, um, as, as volunteers, it really is for those women who don't need to work for money, um, also uh, a way to, to have uh, what for them is a very fulfilling job. Now the set of archives that I particularly enjoy uh, using with my students uh, relates to a set of correspondence um, between one woman who is a representative of the British Women Emigration Association in South Africa and uh, sort of the, the head really of the organisation back in London. It's a series of letters and if we can just think about sort of the distance between Britain and, and South Africa in 1899 when these are being sent, we can imagine that it's a correspondence taking place over many, many, many weeks. And if, what they're particularly exercised by um, is um, the goings-on um, in the household of Mr and Mrs Blackman. So basically what happens is a series of nannies are sort of being sent out uh, to the Blackman household and things keep going wrong, basically. Um, so in this letter here, uh, it's a letter uh, from uh, Mrs Joyce uh, to Helen Knockup. So those are two women corresponding between South Africa and the UK. Um, and we discover that Mr Blackman has gone to pick up Sarah Richmond um, from, from the port um, on Saturday and by Tuesday um, basically she's run away and they can't find her. Um, when they go down to the port they discover that, that she has basically met, met a soldier on, on, board the, on board the boat and they've got married and uh, basically you know the soldier said this is my wife you know sort of go away. Um, so the women in the British Women's Emigration Association are trying to smooth things over really with, with Mrs Blackman. This is a bit embarrassing. Um, she, she has actually paid the passage um, of this woman. Um, she kind of wants her money back. That's a lot of a discussion as well. Um, and it, it gives an insight into the ways in, in which, you know, it's very obvious that women here are expected to manage the domestic sphere. And the fact that this girl ha has run away is her fault um, and also the fault um, of Mrs Blackman. But there's quite an interesting sort of different story sort of running through it that you can pick up through certain phrases, but also through the annotations. So one of the things that, that is quite striking about these documents is the fact that they're typed. Um, and one might wonder, were they, you know, were the originals typed? So you can see that actually copy um, is written at, at the top of this um, and so which suggests that maybe it was typed up afterwards. So they're trying to work out what's happened in the Blackman household, they're trying to placate Mrs Blackman um, but there's also suspicions that start to emerge about why exactly uh, Sarah Richmond ran away um, and it also transpires that, that this isn't the first time that, that uh, um, someone they've sent has disappeared um, and there was a, a young girl um, who got pregnant. And at one point, uh, one of the women in the Emigration Association writes, there must be terrible temptation in the Blackman household. So she's 
basically saying, actually, these were girls of good character before we sent them away, and you know something's going on in that house that, that is not um, that is not down to us, and is perhaps down to that family. So why is this interesting in terms of sort of looking at colonial history? Well, obviously, you know, this is another example of the way in which women participate in in the colonial project. Women are exercising certain margins of manoeuvre, they have a degree of power in the organisation of this relationship. But it's also very obvious, even though the, the, there are no letters from men in any of this exchange, that it's the men who are in charge. Um, the fact that when, when um, Sarah Richmond runs away, um, you know, she probably would have been dragged back if it hadn't been the fact that a man said, this is my wife. Um, and it is Mrs Blackman who is held responsible for what's going on in her house and with the you know, well, the husband's in that um, suspicion is cast upon it, but he's sort of not held responsible for it. So I think that's very interesting in thinking about the fact that, yes, these women, you know, these upper class women, they have power over, you know, the, the middle and working class women they're recruiting. Um, they have power over, you know, the colonised men and women in the societies, you know, to which they emigrate. But actually, they still don't have power over, you know, the European men that, that surround them. So thinking about how all those different um, power structures intersect with each other and what margins of manoeuvre different women have and some obviously have more than others. So one of the other things that, that I like to do um, with my students with this set of documents is something called speculative history, which is a phrase used by um, a historian of African American history, Sidia Hartman. And that's the idea, it's, it sort of goes beyond, if you like, techniques such as reading against the grain or reading between the lines. And it's the idea that you take a character that is here that really you know hardly anything about and you speculate, obviously using the historical elements at your disposal, about what their story might be. And that's a brilliant way of sort of not only multiplying the perspectives, but also thinking about whose voices are more likely to get heard in the archives, whose voices are largely absent, but you know, that's not a fatality. What are the different strategies and techniques can we use to begin to redress that balance? So finally, we're going to be looking at some of the archives of Ina Beasley. So she's an educationalist, um, and what we're particularly interested here um, is her role um, in Sudan, um, um, basically sort of with an overview role as a controller of girls' education. So Sudan in the first half of the 20th century, what we're talking about geographically is what is today Sudan and South Sudan together. Um, and it was actually under sort of a joint uh, British and, and Egyptian uh, colonial rule, but really sort of the British um, have the upper hand in this. One of the motivations of the British, uh, you know, in the 40s and 50s of beginning to get involved in girls' education is uh, to basically sort of strengthen their hand um, over uh, over the Egyptians. So re really, this this is about um, giving an an English education or something to perceive to be an English education to really girls of the elite. This is not you know mass education in any way, shape, or form, but but as a way of countering or or making more British friendly sort of Sudanese sort of nationalist and Sudan uh, becomes well declares independence in 1955 becomes independent in 1956. Um, so Ina Beasley is a really interesting um, character she's a perfect example of the fact that there are not goodies and baddies in, in any history she is a very complicated woman and she exemplifies in many ways the complicated relationship of European women uh, with colonialism. So it is, you know, goes without saying really, it's uncontested that she's absolutely passionate about girls' education, whether that be um, in Britain um, or whether that be uh, in Sudan. Um, she gets a PhD herself at a time where actually very few women uh, were in higher education in Britain, let alone getting a PhD. Um, if we just look at this um, article published um, in the Sudan Star in 1949, um, she gives a speech um, with a, sort of the headline, a girl should have a heart in her career, which is, you know, it's not really a mainstream view in, in 1949. 
so when we're thinking about girls' education um, in Sudan, but also girls' education as part of you know any late colonial project, um, you know across uh, all the European empires, we also need to situate this within sort of a broader sort of developmentalist agenda. Um, so the idea that um, towards the end of the colonial period, we're actually going to start investing a little bit in these colonies, not too much, a little bit, um, but we're going to invest in them more uh, with the aim of modernising them, modernising them along sort of the lines of a European idea, obviously, of, of what is modern, um, and therefore they're either going to be sort of more economically productive for the metropole, or they're going to be sort of more prepared for independence. But of course, there's very different ideas about what that independence might look like and what role the former colonial power might continue to play. This is a really rich set of archives. So there's four boxes, um, and they haven't actually been fully um, sort of inventoried yet. So, so it's quite a treasure trove, and it's also a little bit random. And if you're like me and you love to go down the rabbit hole of random objects that you find in archives, you're going to really enjoy these boxes. So, for example, I found her personal diary from 1953, and I spent quite a lot of time trying to decipher her handwriting because I think it's a story about an unrequited love affair. So, for example, this poster, which is published you know, by Her Majesty's Stationery Office and is really meant to showcase um, to the Sudanese, but also to the British, you know, how great the British are, uh, particularly perhaps in, compar in comparison with the Egyptian. So these are all classic images of, of late colonial uh, development. You know, we have a picture of a modern port, a picture of a tractor, you have a tractor, you know, embodies uh, modernisation. And sending girls to school also does this. And so, you know, this is what Ina Beasley particularly is involved in. Um, so it is primarily uh, an education that is about you know, sewing and domestic science and um, learning how to knit and things like that. These girls are being sort of taught uh, a very European model of what hygiene looks like. So there's no real acknowledgement that, that probably, you know, these girls do know how to wash laundry um, or to, you know, how to put babies' nappy on or things like that. But it's the idea that um, or what is imparted to them is that there are modern ways of doing these things and these modern ways come from the colonial power and we're going to teach you how to do them so that you can be modern too. We might want to nuance that picture. So if we look, for example, at someone like Hubertine Auclair, um, who is a French suffragist again in the late 19th century, she travels to Algeria and when she writes about the condition of colonised women there, a lot of what she does is actually undermining the colonial the French narrative or sort of a civilising mission, the idea of sort of European uh, superiority, cultural, moral superiority over the people that it's sort of subjugating. So she looks, for example, um, at the condition of women in Algeria. She makes comparisons which are really rather unfavourable uh, to European men. Um, she says, you know, some of the comparisons she makes, she's actually saying actually the condition of Algerian women in some contexts is better than European women. And she also says that actually no country uh, is civilised until, you know, women, women have rights and can participate sort of fully in public life. So she's not an anti-colonialist, um, but she's not necessarily sort of, you know, towing uh, an imperialist line either. Thank you.